Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. All right, so uh, we will now move on to a second practice problem or a second class exercise. So here we are going to sort of transition from a one dimensional real uh, line, uh, you know, representation of spatial locations to a two dimensional, uh, you know, representation on a circle. So I'm going to read down, read out the problem and then we will sort of step by step uh, start to resolve. Uh, the issues that arise with spatial dependent structure in a two dimensional space. So consider a real estate market for a circular city with n equally spaced homes that are located along the city's circumference of k units. Okay, so what we have, what we are talking about is a circular city. So I'm going to draw a circle, all right. And now we have n equally spaced homes. So the circumference of this, uh, this circle is k. So, you know, and there are n homes which are equidistant from each other. So that means that there is going to be, uh, you know, homes or houses placed on this circle at a distance of k by n along the circumference, uh, you know, as we go. So let's call this as location one. So, you know, the, the first star that I've drawn is location one and I'm going to go in the, uh, you know, in, in the clockwise direction and, and, and keep sort of adding a dot or a location for a home every k by n units apart. Okay, of course, I'm going to do it uh, with approximation uh, because I don't know n, I do not know what is k by n, it's just a, uh, it's just a schematic not to scale representation on your screens. So, say this is uh, home 1, home 2, uh, equidistant to 2 is home 3, then we have 4, we have 5 and 6 and so on and so forth till we get to a point where we have a home here called nth, nth home. The home price at each location i is denoted as pi. So the price of a house that is, uh, you know, that is, that's the market that's kind of observed in the market, in the real estate market of this circular city is, you know, indexed by its location. So at location one, the price is p1, at location two, it's p2, at location three, it's p3, p4, p5, p6, and all the way till pn, okay. Now, it, this price, these prices are assumed to be correlated with prices of homes that are i's first order neighbors, okay. So at any location i, I look at the location on the right to it, okay, okay. So one step in the clockwise direction, one step in the anti-clockwise direction. So for every i, I will look at location i minus 1 and location i plus 1. So I'm going to say for location 2, I'm going to say that the price p2 is correlated with price at location 2 minus 1, that is p1, and location 2 plus 1, that is uh, p3. Okay. And, and obviously for 3, of course, you know, it's going to be 3 minus 1, that is p2, and P3 is going to be correlated with, correlated with 3 plus 1 at location 3 plus 1, which is P4, right? So this is how the correlation structure is, is going on in space. Now, although this is all uh, quite, you know, uh, uh, this is a model. And of course, you know, it is a representation of what happens in the real world. All it is trying to say is that the real estate prices uh, in the real world can be represented by a situation where you know, they are highly correlated with immediate neighbors and not so correlated with those who are farther apart, okay? So 
maybe you know you can say that homes in a particular locality can be considered neighbors and homes in different localities or between localities are non neighbors right so that kind of a situation is what this uh, particular uh, stylized uh, you know uh, 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 um, setting is providing us okay we define this set and i which contains uh, you know the neighbors of i that is n i is a set which contains i minus 1 and i plus 1 so neighbors of 2 neighbors of you know the home or house at location 2 are the are houses at location 1 and 3 neighbors of uh, you know how the house at location 3 are the houses at location 2 and 4 what about uh, you know the neighbors of uh, uh, you know of, of house at location 1 what about location 1 well here the neighbors are n and 2 okay so so because it's a it's a circular city instead of a real number line where n only had one neighbor now it also sort of has the second neighbor which is house one similarly the set for you know uh, of neighbors at location n will be location n minus one and location one okay and so on and so forth so so basically we can define this set for to that 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 contains neighborhood houses as n i it's a it's a very efficient sort of a efficient mathematical notation i would say okay so needless to say uh, for the given uh, case study that n i number of elements in each set n i is 2 which is correct so you know we have i minus 1 and i plus 1 so we have two elements in n i which is fine and uh, if j is in n i then i must be in n j that is if is if j is in the neighborhood set of i then i must be in the neighborhood set of j which is also correct if we look at the examples that we have written out here let the home prices p i be drawn from a normally distributed random process such that expectation of p expectation of p is the population you know uh, mean mu p and the covariance structure which is the spatial dependence structure covariance p i p j where i and j are locations i and j so we have a spatial dependence structure which exhibits correlated prices with first order neighbors something that has been written down in english right so whatever is written in english it is translated it with translated with mathematical uh, you know notation so covariance p i p j if is sigma squared if i minus j equals 0 that is variance at a location i that is variance of p i is simply sigma squared for all i okay all i in 1 2 n okay covariance of uh, you know bit of prices between locations i and j if they are an immediate neighborhood is given by sigma squared lambda and lambda can be between minus 1 and plus 1 so now we are allowing for negative spatial autocorrelation as well in the two dimensional space right so of course now needless to say that the circle represents a 2d world two dimensional world and 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 for for homes that are farther apart there is no correlation right so we've discussed this now again this is uh, we've discussed this earlier the first query is write down the full variance covariance matrix for the given random process okay so i'm going to have to write down the variance covariance matrix for the given uh, random process so i'm going to do that so i've been given this uh, this vector of prices p this vector of prices p which is nothing but p1 p2 all the way till pn all of these are distributed jointly right There's, it's a random function we are working with spatial data something that we have covered in one of the earlier lectures so we are working with a jointly distributed normal uh, you know uh, uh, distribution right so they are jointly distributed 
normal random uh, variables. With mean mu p, something that is provided as information, and the variance covariance given as some sigma p. Okay, so I know that you know my uh, my p is a n by one, so n by one vector. So there are n rows and one column, right? So p one, p two, p three, p four, p five till p n, right? And 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 so mu p, which is the expectation of each p, is nothing but n by one. So this itself is a vector, and the variance covariance matrix is going to be a n by n matrix because it should contain all the variance values and the covariances, right? So this is something we have seen earlier that for a vector which is n by one size, the variance covariance matrix is n by n size, right? So variance of p, where p is a n by 1, is given as sigma p. So I'm going to draw a n by n matrix. So I'm going to have n columns and n rows. So let's say each row represents i's. So i equals 1, 2, 3, all the way till n and columns represents locations j so far as the covariance structure goes okay so if for the first cell of this variance covariance matrix when i equals j that is i minus j absolute value is zero then the variance covariance uh, the covariance structure will tell me that uh, the diagonal element will be sigma squared. Similarly, for all diagonal elements, when i and j are equal, exactly equal, what I'm going to find is a sigma squared value at all diagonal elements. For the first of diagonal element, where i equals 1 and j equals 2, we can go back to our covariance structure and write this value to be sigma squared lambda. For the third position, however, 1 and 3 are two positions apart, no correlation, we will have a 0. So we will have a 0 at 4, at 5, and keep going. At location n, we have we know that in neighborhood set of location 1, n is 1's neighbor. It's in fact the first order neighbor of 1, right? So 1 will have a spillover from and to location n and location 2 okay so the value of this of diagonal element in the first row and nth column of this variance covariance matrix is going to be sigma squared lambda okay similarly when we move to i equals 2 and j equals 3 i'm going to have sigma squared lambda uh, at 3 and 4 sigma squared lambda so you can see that the the, the elements that are right, you know, besides this element, uh, this diagonal elements, you know, uh, uh, sigma squares are going to be sigma squared lambda. Now, variance covariance matrix is a symmetric matrix. So you're going to have sigma squared lambda, uh, sigma squared lambda, zero, uh, 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 and so on and so forth, right? So you're going to have sigma squared lambda, um, sigma squared lambda okay now just just like you have uh, you know uh, oh, n is in the neighborhood set of 1 1 is in the neighborhood set of n so we will have a uh, you know uh, in the spirit of symmetry of the variance covariance matrix uh, the element in row n and column 1 of sigma uh, of, of variance covariance matrix sigma is going to be sigma squared lambda. Everything else is going to be zeros. Okay, I'm going to have all these things are going to be zeros. Okay, so this is the first query that you know we this this matrix that I've written down here is the variance covariance matrix of of the given random process. I'm going to write it again just so it is absolutely clear. 
So it's n by n. All the diagonal elements are sigma squares. Okay. The off diagonal elements, the first order of diagonal elements are sigma squared lambdas. Okay. Okay. And then the second order diagonal elements are zeros, except for this aberration between one and n, which happen to be neighbors. So I'm just going to fill them in. Um, Okay, um, I'm going to have 0, 0, and then sigma squared lambda. Okay, I hope this is absolutely clear. So, you should, you should definitely write this out by yourself so that it becomes very, very clear what is going on here, okay? So now we have this spatial dependent structure condensed in this n by n matrix sigma. So let's take the next step. All right, next. It says, say you have a sample, is sample meaning realizations at each value on that circle, where P1 is one, P2 is two, and so on. So the value of Pi is simply I, which is, the value of the home at location i is just i. So somehow the location itself is an indicator of value, right? So it's a specific, again, a very specific example. Then deduce the consistent estimator of, rho, uh, of uh, omega p, sorry, uh, uh, mu p, which is the population mean, and those for the 95% confidence bands of mu p. How does your estimator depend on spatial heterogeneity if any, in the given data. Very careful, we are talking about spatial heterogeneity, something that you have learned, heard of, and learned earlier. Okay, so again, I'm going to quickly write down, you know, uh, just visualize my data, because this will help me, you know, move forward. P1 to Pn. It turns out that P1 is 1, P2 is 2, P3 is 3, P4 is 4, P5 is 5, P6 is 6, and so on and so forth, and Pn is n. Okay, they're asking me what is the estimator of mu p. Well, we have learned earlier the best guess of mu p from a given sample is just p bar, which is summation i equals 1 to n, pi by n and this is going to be nothing but summation i equals 1 to n i over n okay interestingly in the numerator i have the sum of you know n uh, natural numbers going from 1 2 3 4 till n right and we uh, you know uh, you must be aware from high school that this value is n n plus 1 over and there is an n sitting in the denominator, so I basically have n plus 1 over 2. This is n plus 1 over 2 is the, uh, you know, sample mean and my best guess for what, you know, uh, 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 the population mean would be, okay? Now, of course, p bar itself is comprising p i's, which are random variables, so p bar is a random variable. If it is a random variable and I have a point estimate of p bar of, of, of p bar in terms of n plus 1 over 2, it comes with an error because random variables can take multiple realizations, right? So the idea is that, okay, if it comes with an error, how do I contextualize that error or come up with a 95% confidence band to have uh, some level of, you know, uh, 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 certainty of where what is the range of values that, you know, uh, uh, mu p can really take as far as re its representation uh, by p bar, right? So to evaluate the confidence band, to evaluate the confidence band of mu p, 
right? Uh, we need we need an estimate of variance of you know uh, p bar, okay? And the variance of p bar is nothing but variance of summation i equals one to n p i over n, and we saw this in the in, in, in a couple of lectures ago that when you have spatial dependence, we can represent this variance as a covariance, uh, you know, formulation, which is nothing but 1 over n squared summation i goes from 1 to n, summation j goes from 1 to n, covariance p i p j, okay. And uh, now to be able to sort of sum these covariances, for, for all different, uh, you know, uh, combinations of i comma j. Remember, I can take value 1 and j 2 and vice versa. I can be 2 and j 1. So, we are, have to double count these things, right? So, what we really are doing here when we are evaluating this, uh, this double summation operator is basically we are counting all the elements in the variance covariance matrix. So, this first step was very helpful, was indeed very helpful. Right. So, this will basically what I am take doing is I am summing sigma squared, sigma squared in the diagonal elements n times. The off diagonal elements I am summing 2 n times because you know they appear twice on the uh, right of the diagonal and the left of the diagonal. Okay. So, I am going to just, I am just going to follow that. I am going to say 1 over n squared, I have n sigma squares and 2 n times sigma squared lambdas. Right. And so, I have sigma squared over n 1 plus 2 lambda, okay. Now, if, if p i's were spatially independent, lambda would be 0 and I would, I would come back with, I will get back my sigma squared by n valuation. So, by virtue of this spatial dependence structure and the degree of spatial dependence that is exhibited by this parameter lambda, there is a bias that is induced in the variance if we were to ignore the spatial dependence in these data, okay? So, if I have my variance of p bar, I can evaluate my standard deviation of p bar, which is sigma over root n times 1 plus 2 lambda the square root, okay? And this will imply the 95 percent confidence bang for, uh, you know, uh, mu p can be given as p bar minus 1.96 sigma over root n times 1 plus 2 lambda, okay, comma p bar plus 1.96 times sigma n times 1 plus 2 lambda. Of course, 2 lambda has a power of 1 half, which is as the square root uh, of, of, of this value. So, this is the confidence band, 95 percent confidence band of, of mu p, okay? And, you know, obviously, we know that p bar is nothing but n plus 1 by 2. So, these things are, are this is something we have evaluated right, uh, you know, on this on this page. Now, the next question, the last part of this question they, says, how does your estimator depend on spatial heterogeneity? Now, we had said that spatial heterogeneity is a, is a pattern which represents long-term trend. For example, when, when we were looking at, you know, uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the real estate values across Delhi, we saw a low to high gradient from, uh, from uh, you know, the west to the eastern part of the city, okay, or the national capital territory of Delhi, right? So, what, what, would, what that would translate is that somehow spatial heterogeneity should be a function of i, right? It should be a function of location. And if you look at both p bar and variance of p bar and by extension standard deviation of p bar and the confidence bounds, none of them depend on i, they are all independent of i, right? So, what we see here is that p bar is independent of i, 
that is it does not depend on the location it is not varying by location okay higher priced homes are not clustered in a given at a given sort of location on this circle relative to lower priced home at a different clustered location right we do not have p bar as a function of i furthermore variance of p bar and standard deviation of p bar are independent of i and and by extension the 95% confidence bounds or the confidence interval for mu p is also independent well it's not mu p it's supposed to be p bar because mu p is is a truth it's constant right so the confidence interval will be for p bar so that's that's uh, that's something you can call a typo in the question but but i've corrected it here okay so is also this 95% confidence uh, interval is also independent of i that means that you know our estimators do not depend on spatial heterogeneity there is no impact of spatial heterogeneity on our estimators right so spatial heterogeneity emerges due to trends that are a function of i none of our estimators are a function of i hence there is no impact of spatial heterogeneity in these uh, in these data all right so uh, let's move forward the next uh, question is calculate the amount or the quantum of bias generated from not accounting for uh, of spatial dependence in these data right so what is the amount or quantum of bias that would be realized if we did not you know uh, 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 you know account for spatial dependence when the data indeed exhibited that structure okay so um, and 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 we are given that n is 100 and you know lambda can take various values from negative to positive right when i started this lecture i said you know lambda can take positive and negative values so of course we can solve this problem for the uh, you know for the uh, for the um, uh, 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 you know for the for each case but we can also solve it for a general case so first of all you know p bar p bar remains n plus 1 over 2 with iid and spatially dependent data okay that means no bias irrespective of lambda value lambda could be 0 or it could be a negative or positive value between minus 1 and plus 1 right it will have no impact on p bar second bias in variance of p bar well there will be bias and we saw on the previous slide we can go back and check where we said that in case of uh, you know uh, spatially independent data the variance of p bar would be sigma squared over n whereas here it's sigma squared over n plus sigma squared over n times 2 lambda right so uh, we have sigma squared over n plus 2 lambda times sigma squared over n which is the spatially dependent case minus sigma squared over n which is a spatially independent case and hence the bias is 2 lambda sigma squared over n right and of course you can you can now uh, you know put in uh, uh, you know uh, lambda and n and you can uh, you know get these values similarly uh, you know bias in the standard deviation of p bar this you guys can calculate it's it's quite straightforward and and then you know finally the bias in in in, in confidence bounds will come from the bias in standard deviation right so bias in 
confidence bounds, well, more specifically 95% confidence bounds, will come from, will originate from bias in the standard deviation of p bar. I'm going to write this value and I'm going to let you, you know, uh, verify it. I'm going to let you verify it, okay? So this bias, when you eventually verify it, will come out to be two sigma over root n, one plus two lambda, to the power half minus one whole multiplied by 1.96, okay? Um, okay, now, of course, you know, we have asked for these values at different uh, levels of lambda. So, uh, you know, I can just, I can just provide, uh, you know, uh, 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 this value for the case, for the, for the, uh, for the variance. Um, we have lambda, which is, which, which has minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.2, 0 0.4 and 0.9, right? And the bias in variance of p bar will be uh, correspondingly minus 0 0.014 sigma squared, um, minus 0 0.004 sigma squared, um, 0 0.008 sigma squared, and 0 0.018 sigma squared. So I'm writing corresponding bias values. You can go back and check, uh, you know, at your, uh, in your time, okay? Similarly, the bias here with lambda will be, lambda is all these values minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.9, right? And, 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 and bias in standard deviation of P bar will simply be, uh, you know, uh, 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 the first one will be a complex number. It's because the square root of a negative entity. So minus 0.1 plus 0 0.06 iota times sigma uh, comma minus 0 0.02 sigma 0 0.03 sigma and 0 0.07 sigma. Okay. I strongly encourage that you go ahead and you verify these. Uh, these solutions. The bias in 95% confidence interval, as I've said, will simply originate from standard deviation of p bar. So they will be simply these values, right? So you can simply uh, carry them forward uh, to this case. Okay, let's move forward to this circular city example. And, uh, you know, uh, we finally have uh, this, uh, this query where we are saying that what if, what if we were to extend this first order spatial dependent structure to a second order spatial dependent structure. Not only that, where the strength of interdependence among the first order neighbors will be double the strength of interdependence among the second order neighbors. So now we are sort of relaxing this restriction that spatial spillovers or spatial correlation only occurs with the first order neighbors. We are saying that, well, it can also occur with second order neighbors. Okay, so we have a circle, again, we have our P1, uh, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, all of these are equidistant. My figure is not to scale, so you shouldn't sort of, uh, you know, if, they, if the, some pairs look closer, they're not really closer, you know, they're all equidistant, okay? This case is slightly more interesting. It says that, you know, there will be a spillover on the value of P2 from P1 and P3, but also a spillover from, you know, Pn and P4. Although the spillover that is represented by these yellow arrows, which are from the second order neighbors, are half the strength, are half the strength of the first order neighbors, okay? Um, so let's try and exhibit this problem, first of all, in the variance covariance matrix. So we've, we've solved this problem for the previous case, and we saw that, you know, the variance covariance matrix is really good in encompassing all these 
uh, you know, all this, all this knowledge. So I'm going to write down the variance covariance matrix for second order neighbors, the variance covariance matrix for second order neighbors. Um, I mean, second order neighbors and first order neighbors. So we have neighborhood spillovers of the second order, right? So we're not just saying you're only second order, uh, you know, neighborhood spillovers. That would be quite an unrealistic, uh, you know, uh, a setting to work with. So here, rope sigma p is nothing but you have your diagonal elements, which are simply sigma squared, sigma squared, sigma squared, keep going all the way to sigma squared. Okay, now you have on the off diagonal elements, you have sigma squared lambda. And in the second order of diagonal element, you have sigma squared lambda by two. Okay, and if I keep going forward, if you, you will realize that one will also have a spillover from location and minus one. So you will have sigma squared lambda by two and you know, sigma squared lambda to top it off. All others are zeros, okay? Similarly, I can go ahead and fill up these, uh, you know, uh, these entities, sigma squared lambda, sigma squared lambda, sigma squared lambda, I have sigma squared lambda by two, sigma squared lambda by two, right? And sigma squared lambda, and sigma squared lambda by two, and so on and so forth, right? You're gonna have, um, for, for, for entity two, you will have sigma squared lambda by two sitting here, everything else will be zeros, right? So you sort of get a gist of how these things will, uh, you know, look like. So you have sigma squared lambda, sigma squared lambda by two, this is for the nth entity, uh, you know, you have um, um, sigma squared, lambda, sigma squared lambda by two, and all other are zeros, okay? So you can sort of, you can sort of, you know, fill these things in, uh, you know, and, and construct a variance covariance matrix. Again, the estimator for mu p is simply p bar, right? So again, the estimator for mu p is simply p bar, which is n plus one over two, right? But variance of p bar will be different, right? So, so you know now that the variance of p bar is one over n square summation i summation j covariance p i p j. And what we said earlier is it is simply this entity double summation operator is simply summing all the elements in the variance covariance matrix sigma, right? So we are simply summing all these elements in the variance covariance matrix, okay? And if you sum them, what you're gonna have is one over n squared, sigma squared appears n times, sigma squared lambda appears two n times, and uh, 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 sigma squared lambda by two, also appears two n times. So now your uh, bias is going to be slightly more, that is, it's going to be three lambda. So in case of when there is no spatial dependence, it's sigma squared over n. In case of, you know, uh, 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 in case of uh, first order dependence, we had two lambda for first, order dependent structure, right? And one plus three lambda is for the second order dependent structure. So as spatial dependence increases, the bias in the variance of Z bar and consequently in the, in the standard deviation of Z bar, in the, you know, in the confidence bounds of Z bar will start to increase, which, which will, it, it will, in, the bias will enhance. So you will be penalized more in terms of your estimators or your, or your you know, the precision of your estimators uh, if you start to ignore these biases or this spatial dependent structure, 
Okay, so this is uh, this is very this is this was a very interesting example which sort of transitioned us out of that one-dimensional analysis of spatial uh, dependent structure and its implication, its consequences, to a two-dimensional structure. Right. So we started out very simplistic. Uh, understanding, we came to a little bit more uh, sophisticated understanding and going forward we will uh, we will have a even more uh, sophisticated understanding or, or you know uh, 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 of of these uh, of these uh, you know of these entities. As a next step which we will do as a as a, as a, as a separate part or portion of this lecture, I am going to talk about Monte Carlo simulations which is a numerical strategy to evaluate the bias in the variance standard deviation and confidence bounds of you know uh, of of p bar uh, when you know spatial dependence exists in uh, in in the real estate market and we do not have to rely on these analytical methods which which can be mathematically quite complex uh, or analytically quite complex uh, we can fall back on simulations and we will give you an example with this uh, with the same setting that we are working with right now all right see you in the next part of this lecture Thank you.